The shuttle returns right on schedule for America's space program after so many delays a triumph. The two astronauts are well and exultant. At home, the Navy steps in to rearm the Polaris submarine resolution and civil servants all over the country walk out. A hard-hitting report on Concord by a committee of MPs, cut costs or scrap it. A Rochdale mother is reunited with her children from Pakistan after a six-year battle. And tonight's big match, which could decide the Football League champion. Good evening. So the mission is accomplished. At exactly 22 minutes past seven this evening, right on schedule, the world's first winged spacecraft carried out its final maneuver and landed successfully on a Californian desert. Glowing like a hot rock, to quote the commander John Young, Columbia announced its presence over the thousands watching in America with a mild sonic boom. Then, protected by 31,000 heat-resistant tiles, the huge craft glided towards the Edwards Air Force Base. The landing was perfect, and the two astronauts inside, John Young and Bob Crippen, were jubilant. After a brief welcome at the base, they'll fly on to Houston in Texas for a week's debriefing. The journey, then, is over. In two and a quarter days from Cape Canaveral to California, they completed 36 orbits of the Earth and proved that this new form of space exploitation rather than exploration really does work. Reporting now, our correspondent, Martin Bell. It began with a wake-up call from Mission Control. Good morning, boy. Oh, John. Creepy. <laughs> wake up. Time to get up with a big splashdown today. But the astronauts were already up, though they hadn't been seen on television since the night before. When today's first pictures came through, the astronauts were suiting up while the camera showed the last view of Earth before the closing of the payload door. Down below in the California desert, runway 23 was waiting for them. A five-mile track marked out across the dry clay of the lake bed. The chase planes, the T-38s, were also standing by. So were the spectators, the crowds in the desert, as six miles of traffic jammed the main approach to the airbase. Public interest in the shuttle had caught fire. The landing was something that thousands felt they had to see for themselves. On the last orbit before re-entry, an Air Force telescope had its sights on the Columbia. From then on, contact was voice contact only. We're just enjoying the view. We'll be with you for two minutes, and uh, you'll like to know that four chase aircraft have just launched from Eddy and coming up looking for you. Nice and easy does it, John. We're all riding with you. That was the last contact before re-entry. The most hazardous moments of the flight, a test of the heat shield, and a tense 21-minute wait for mission control. Hello, Houston, uh, Columbia's here. Hello, Columbia, Houston's here. How do you read? Plan Fairhand, we're done uh, Mach 10.3, and Columbia Air Force Base is uh, ready for takeoff. Uh, Columbia Air Force Base is ready for takeoff. And we couldn't agree more, John. Your state vector's good. We've got a good data in half. What a way to come to California. Airspeed 271 knots. The Columbia was dropping steeply, coming in at more than 200 miles an hour, a great I glider know. under no power. The landing had to be right. 280 knots. Everything looks real good. Good Touchdown. Look at all, Skipper. 
Welcome home, Columbia. Beautiful, beautiful. People smiling back here, Crip. Good to have you back. The Columbia was more than an hour on the ground before the crew got out. An unexpected delay that had the astronauts just a little impatient. It was something that would have to be worked on, they said, if the thing were to get operational. John Young, the commander, was the first to emerge. The applause was from his fellow workers on the ground at Dryden. Bob Crippen followed. The Columbia and its crew are not all that's been retrieved. The solid rocket boosters, which provided most of the power for liftoff, have been recovered from the Atlantic and towed back to Port Canaveral. The return was shadowed by a Soviet ship, a so-called trawler, but the only fish it was looking for were the boosters, an American variety that swims between space flights. This and the return of the Columbia closed out America's most spectacular space enterprise since the moonshots. It's nearly six years since the Americans had a man in space, and in that time the Russians have had dozens. So on Florida's space coast, where the flight began, there is a feeling, expressed here with more gusto than grammar, of an overdue triumph and of having got one back. Martin Bell, BBC, Cape Canaveral. So the first flight of the space shuttle has been a success even if a success slightly qualified by the problems of the heat-resistant tiles. At least 23 areas of damage have been discovered. But all the experts agree, today marks the start of a new era in space travel. An era in which there will be regular space flights by a small fleet of three or four regularly used spacecraft like this. And we can look ahead now to frequent takeoffs of these sort of things with useful loads into space. For scientists, there'll be things like the space telescope. For the communications engineers, there'll be the possibility of cheaper satellite launchers and perhaps even the repair of satellites in space. And for industry, there could be new processors of metal fabrication and vaccine manufacture in weightless conditions. Europe hopes to take part in this exploitation of space with the Germans leading. We have manufactured the space lab to take scientists up in the shuttle. And in these shuttle flights of the future, so that they can carry on experiments in orbit inside this payload bay. So far, British industry, however, has shown distinctly muted interest in the possibilities of processors carried on in weightless conditions. But the political and military implications of this American success are probably the most important at the moment. For six years, the Russians have had manned spaceflight to themselves, and their orbiting laboratories, the Salyut craft, have been unmatched for reconnaissance or propaganda purposes. Now the Americans have made an enormous leap into a clear space lead. The Russians' verbal attacks on the space shuttle this last week, including saying that it threatens a new arms race, have made their fears clear. If we are indeed going into an era of killer satellites and space weapons, the Americans have a head start. For these orbiters have at least some powers of manoeuvre, and can change the height of their orbits if threatened by any ground-controlled opposition. And if you wanted to design a defence against laser weapons in space, then heat-resistant tiles might seem a very good idea. But, for better or worse, our world won't be the same again after today.